Hey everybody, welcome back to our neck of the woods. So in this video, hopefully, we are officially finally going to finish out the ceiling drywall inside of the house. Uh, Aaron and I got our money from basically refinancing the RV. So there's a few things that we need to check on the property today. You go to the store, start purchasing a few things, and then we'll go from there and see what else we get accomplished in this video. All right, so first things first, uh, we had another problem with the RV, shocking. Uh, not really a new problem, but last night it was down to about eight degrees Fahrenheit. Tonight it's supposed to be like seven, tomorrow it's supposed to be like five, and we had our water pipes freeze, or at least the hot water pipe, which to me didn't make any sense. So when our pipes freeze, uh, it seems like everything underneath of the RV, as it goes from the kind of bathroom area underneath, and then it goes up to the kitchen that's where it always freezes but it was weird last night that only the hot water froze and not the cold so that got me thinking i went down underneath uh inside of the bathroom and underneath of the shower uh, before I've reached my hand as far back in there as possible and I've spray foamed some of the uh, hoses or the pipes that go down into the gray tank and then there's a vent one that goes up to I think up to the roof or somewhere even in the RV I don't know where there's an exhaust actually on that roof but uh, what I noticed was around the corner that you can barely see there's a spot where a bunch of wires are coming up from underneath of the rv and there's absolutely no spray foam there at all but i can't see it underneath of the rv because that's where the gray tank is for the shower so i came in from the living room and removed the whole electrical panel was able to get my hand around in there with aaron's guidance looking from the opposite way and we were able to seal all of those electrical wires that are going from the panel down through the floor and then spreading out through the RV underneath instead of actually having them travel through the walls. So we were able to close that hole and I noticed that the hot PEX line was right over top of that hole. So all that cold air was shooting up and froze the pipe, but the cold line is just kind of sitting off to the side, still sitting on the floor. So last night after I spray foamed it a few hours later, we were able to actually get hot water back even though it was completely freezing outside. So that tells me that that was another fix on the RV that is hopefully permanent that we don't have to worry about anymore. Number two that we need to check on real quick is our water discharge to make sure that it's still all looking good, which it seems to be. We definitely have a pipe down there that is not frozen. There may be a little bit of frozen water sitting in here. No, there's not. It is, I don't know, 20 degrees out maybe right now, but that little bit of water sitting on that lip right there is still completely uh, unfrozen. So that is a good thing. And the reason why that probably is, I asked the well drillers, is there any way they can figure out uh, that they would know based on their softener, how much sodium that would actually be in our system. And the company Water Right actually sent them a brochure that he then uh, sent to me. And based on our initial hardness, it looks like we have about 900 milligrams of sodium per gallon of water. Now that's not terrible. I mean, a can of soup is gonna have 900 milligrams. So, uh, and a can of soup's obviously only, you know, a little can as opposed to 900 milligrams being in an entire gallon. So that's not that bad, but that is still 900 milligrams more sodium in your daily diet so maybe that is something that we have to discuss and think about to where if we are cooking and getting bottles of water that we can actually go ahead and purchase a reverse osmosis system so that we're just not putting that much more sodium in our diet but it is a good thing to see that that water's not freezing over there and that probably has to do with the a little bit of sodium that actually is in that water as it discharges out of there from the softeners and uh, maybe the mineral content uh, that's actually in the sump pump when it actually turns on and discharges the draining. All right, so another update here. Aaron just left and I just opened that garage a second ago. Uh, it looks like the radiant heat is on. 
We're at 54 degrees right now and we're trying, uh, it is set to 55. So I'm not sure how long this has been running for, but just a quick test I wanted to uh, look at. I did lower the boiler from 140 back down to 120. So the test here is to see how big that difference is from before when we were at 180 and then the water was coming back through the concrete floor at I believe 75. So there was a 60 degree difference there. It will be interesting to see today what lowering the uh, thermostat actually does because right now it looks like we're at about 115 uh, coming in. So that's the same as it was last time. The boiler was set at 140. Uh, the water out here was 135. So if we're at 120 right now, it makes sense that we're at 115. So this gauge again is either five degrees off or we're losing five degrees for the 20 foot run that we have going down along this upper pipe, going down through the basement on the floor and then going up into the boiler. And it looks like our temperature coming back in is actually a little bit above 75. So that is interesting. There is no point in putting 140 degree temperature into the concrete when it's coming back at 75. Uh, it must just be losing its heat as it goes out through the floor, but there's no sense in turning the boiler all the way up to 140 if the water's only coming back at 75. It's still coming back at 75, but the boiler being set down to 120 means that we're gonna burn less propane and use less BTUs because you're not having to get up an initial heat so high. But that is weird. Let me know what you guys think about that. That's funny that you can lower the boiler that much in temperature, but it's still coming back at the same temperature and we're still maintaining a, a, a very comfortable 55 degrees here in the garage. All right, last update. I did tease you got about this uh, in the last video that we got one of our doors installed. So first off, we got 33.2 degrees in the house. So I think the insulation is working in the floor joists. We've got it. We just have to get that knocked out tonight, but that is one of the doors that we have installed. It's not 100%. I ran out of shims and I'm gonna need some more screws to do some more, but we've got it 100% flush. It looks beautiful. Uh, if I haven't mentioned this before, these doors are a naughty oddler uh, type of wood along with their door frames. This one just so happens to be only 32 inches wide, which is the standard. But as you can see, that is an eight foot tall door. So it kind of matches the uh, pretty increased uh, crazy height that we have in the house. Uh, this over here is just a doorway. It's not a door, but everything is eight foot. And then I think over here, we actually have a 36 inch door because we have stuff obviously that we need to bring into the house. So 36 matches this 36, but that is only a six foot, eight foot door, as opposed to all the interiors that are actually a true eight foot. All right, so let's head down in the basement and let's see if the insulation feels like it's actually working. Cause even though it may be set at, I think 43 degrees or uh, 45, I can't remember on the thermostat, it'll be interesting to see how much more comfortable it feels. Cause even though before it was crazy warm that it's holding in all of that heat, um, when we put the insulation in, I think it's, it's going to feel like a more comfortable 45 degrees, if that makes sense. Um, it, it, it's kind of like, uh, it being warm in your house, but you having a blanket on or not a blanket, it's still the same temperature, but when you're holding that heat in a little bit better, I think it actually feels hotter than what the thermostat may actually be. So let's move this and go down there and see what it actually feels like, especially because the sun was out all day and sun was probably coming in those Southern windows and actually heating the basement up more than what the thermostat is set to. All right, so down here in the basement, the other thing I wanted to check on is just to make sure none of the insulation has fallen down. There was a few spots where you could tell, actually I'm looking right now, there's a few spots I can tell it's actually fallen down a little bit than where it initially was. I knew that was gonna happen uh, just because of how I was pressing it up in there, but we are probably gonna have to buy at least one or two of those packs of guide wires. Uh, in the future, if a panel were to complete, or a bat were to completely fall down and hit the drywall, probably not the end of the world because it's still gonna be touched uh, or pushed up in there, that it's gonna be stopping some of that sound transmission and keeping the heat in, but we're not gonna have drywall up in here for probably years to come. 
So we definitely don't want it falling down onto the ground. But again, in the future, if it did ever fall down and hit the drywall, at least it's still held up in there and it's that we actually aren't losing it all together. So here's a spot right here in this particular joist. You can see it's definitely a lot lower than if I push this back up in there where probably I initially had it. So yeah, we're probably gonna have to get a few guide wires just for a little bit of safety on any spots that we see fall down. But uh, I was planning on that. I was just hoping not having to 100% do it. But uh, yeah, we're gonna have to get some just for safety's sake. All right, so 45 degrees down here in the basement. Uh, the heater is not actually running. Looks like only the garage is since that's what we were feeling and uh, that's what we knew was going on when we were stepping out in the garage. So that is great. So tonight, we're gonna go to the store, pick up some of those one by threes. We're gonna go to a few different ones. Hopefully we've got them. We can finish out all of the cross bracing out through here and down this side. And then tonight, hopefully we can 100% finish up insulating the basement and maybe they'll have the guide wires in stock also and we can purchase some of those. So that's the game plan, at least for today. Finish up the basement, let's keep it warm down here, and then hopefully we'll be able to pick up the drywall lift and we'll go ahead and hopefully finish out the ceiling on the upstairs uh, floor. All right guys, transitioned upstairs, new day. We're starting some more drywall. Just busted out a few panels. We got the uh, lift. We're gonna transition out of the uh, office here and got a few outside panels on here real quick just to start closing things in a little bit so we can get more of an idea of what gonna, it's gonna look like. Uh, just knocked out the rest of that back wall up in there. Got that ceiling fully on, and now we can move the lift out here and actually continue up this ceiling over here. So game plan tonight, hopefully we just get uh, at least one whole side covered. I gotta get the uh, compressor out of the basement, start nailing up the furring strips, and then we can go ahead and push the drywall up there. But it doesn't look like we're gonna have a lot of drywall to actually finish everything tonight. Probably because we use several panels uh, over in there. We got one panel down in there covering the hole. And then uh, obviously finishing out the office space um, on that back wall, that's all five eighths. But uh, this wall over here that I just did, that's only half inch. So we only have a few panels of half inch that we can throw in some places. And we only have maybe five or six five eighths left over. So unfortunately we'll have to make a run to the store tomorrow to go pick those up. But we do need to get the truck bed cleared of snow because it has been snowing all day and yesterday. So obviously we can't go pick up drywall and just set that on there. But again, let's see if uh, the camera will not die with uh, it being uh, 41 degrees in here right now. It's actually crazy. Uh, the space heater's been running for a few hours now. And even though we have no insulation anywhere, like up in the ceiling, that guy's been running for a few hours now. And we started at 32 degrees and we're all the way up to 41 and a half. So that's crazy that just the drywall right in here with the heater several feet away can actually heat all of this area up and get it to rise up that many degrees in temperature. That's pretty crazy. So uh, let's set up, let's knock out some furring strips and let's get going on this.
just want to be able to taste and smell coffee again. <laughs> it sucks. Hey everybody, welcome back for another day. So, uh, we wrapped up the other night, camera died. I didn't get that much more drywall done on the ceiling. Uh, I was down to one more piece of drywall and I just didn't have the energy to hang another one. Uh, we're, it's really difficult now. We're three sheets up on the drywall plus that 16 inch starter strip that we had and I cannot do anything more from the ladder. Even though that ladder uh, is probably a good, I don't know, 10 feet or more and with me standing on the top runners uh, at six feet plus, you know, another two feet up, I can't really reach any more up on there. So I've got this scaffolding over here that I'm borrowing from a neighbor for like the past six months. Um, I'm gonna have to go to Home Depot, purchase another scaffolding, and hopefully his is the exact same as the Home Depot. So that way I can stack it on top of each other. I'm also gonna have to pay for the outriggers, so when I'm up that high, it doesn't fall over. But I'm pretty sure two of those together, being at six foot plus another six foot, being at 12 foot plus me standing, well, um, the peak of the ceiling in there is only about 16 foot. So I should be able to stand at 12 foot plus another six foot and be able to work right at the peak there and not have to worry about anything. But again, that lift only goes up 15 foot. So the last piece hopefully is not more than like two foot wide and I'll be able to set that up there by myself and get it drilled in. I did ask my dad to come down. He said maybe he can make it this weekend. So on that last bit of peak, if I need someone else up on the scaffolding with me to hold the ends, uh, however wide that piece is, hopefully by this weekend, we'll be able to 100% knock out the rest of the drywall on the ceiling inside of the house. But we're also out of kerosene, so it's pretty cold uh, down in the house right now. So tonight we're gonna transition down into the basement. Uh, we're gonna finish off that last 15 joists that we have with the cross bracing. And I went ahead and got my order of these uh, pieces here from Home Depot. They're 24 inches long. They're the metal guide wires that I was talking about. Uh, this particular company says that there's 500 of them inside of this order. And I think they were maybe like 40 bucks or something. Um, I just hope there is a real 500 because I saw some complaints online where uh, some of the boxes had opened up and people only received like 200 wires. So uh, these, they are made of steel. This box absolutely weighs a ton. Um, these are the 24 inchers. So we are gonna have to cut them down and jam them up in between the joists so they basically go like that and hold the insulation up. Uh, but hopefully they're easy to cut being steel and I have something that can actually snip these because the only other option with these were the 15 and a half inch wide ones. And again, if you try to stuff a 15 and a half inch wire and you're using traditional lumber, you'd be good because you're only 14 and a half inches wide. But since we're 15 and a half inches wide because we have eye joists with that real thin uh, half inch OSB webbing, I wasn't gonna try and get a 15 and a half inch guide wire to stuff in a 15 and a half inch hole. I mean, the guide wire would probably just fall right out and not hold it up. So we're gonna have to snip several inches off each one of these. Hopefully I've got something just quick and easy that I can just snip as I go and start shoving up, up, up in there. But by the end of tonight, hopefully all of the uh, cross bracing will be done. All the guide wires will be in where I need them to be. But unfortunately I am going to run out of insulation, which completely sucks. Uh, those 20 bags weren't enough. All right, so back down in the basement, feels comfortable. 44 degrees, thermostat was set at 43 degrees. So we're not actually on right now, so that is awesome. But unfortunately, the garage is on. The garage has me worried. Uh, when I work down here in the basement, I can hear the boiler kicking on and it's not very loud at all. Like, as you can hear, I mean, there's almost no sound at all for this thing to be running but i can hear that slight little hum turning on and it seems to be turning on all the time so the garage has me worried the garage feels super comfortable and it's only set to 55 degrees but right now the thermostat set at uh 53 so it's trying to raise up that two degrees i'm wondering how long that system runs for because again if you remember we lowered the boiler to 120 and right now we're actually coming back at 85. So that's five degrees hotter than it ever has been. But why is the garage turning on so much and taking so long to heat up? 
Um, that's got me worried. You know, I spent all that time and money on the zip R paneling to get that thermal break. We've got two by eight walls with sprayed in uh, insulation. We've got some pretty good insulation up in the attic. That um, we do have obviously the attic access hatch that could use a little bit more insulation and maybe put an interior uh, ceiling or door in it. So when you pull the hatch down, there's another like foam panel that you have to like push up and out of the way. Because the other day I did notice that uh, there was a spot on the garage roof where the snow was kind of melted. So that looks like it was right above the attic access hatch where we only have like an R maybe three foam panel that's attached to the bottom of that hatch door. So obviously an R3 is gonna let all the garage heat up and into the attic. And then I think it actually may be melting the snow on the roof, which of course you're gonna get ice damming as that snow melts and then tries to back up under my shingles. So good reason why we put ice and water shield over the entire roof and not just the first two layers at the eaves, which is code. So if we do get ice damming and backing up, we've got that ice and water shield uh, keeping the roof 100% waterproof. But uh, we are gonna have to seal that access uh, hatch up better so we're not melting snow up there. But that is one thing that I did notice the other day. But besides that, there's nothing else we can really do. I mean, the garage doors are only an R13 value, so we can have some heat loss through there. And then because we have been getting some snow, I have noticed on the outside of the garage door, on the concrete, the snow gets melted about six inches out. So there must be some crazy battle going on where the garage floor concrete is hot. It's getting its heat out of the garage about six inches, but then that concrete apron is also freezing and right there, there's like a cold battle going on. But it seems like the garage heat is winning since it's outside of the garage versus the cold that's trying to come into the garage. But that just sucks that the garage is still running nonstop. But the, the pump is still on a high speed. The temperature's been lowered to 120. I don't know, should we, will the boiler run less if we turn this back up to, uh, you know, 140 degrees maybe, uh, and get the garage up to heating faster? Because it just doesn't make sense which way we're gonna win. Is burning more propane at 140 degrees getting the garage up to temperature faster? or lowering it is using less BTUs, but if it's running longer, you end up burning more propane in the long run. So I don't know, we're still playing with it, but uh, the garage actually has me worried and that sucks. But on the flip side, it is like 10 degrees outside and we're gonna get into the single digit. So that is technically the absolute coldest time that we've ever seen. So if it's only doing that a few days out of the whole entire year, then I guess it's not that much propane that we're losing. All right, so now to just cut a million guide wires 500 of these uh, I do have an old set of uh, kind of dikes in a way they do have a uh, ability to cut these steel pins and it doesn't look like it's really hurting uh, the clippers at all I don't see any dents so that cuts very easy so 500 of these to cut up and then uh, we'll get them all installed All right, so guide wires are all done with everything that I've done so far. We've got probably over half of a box left, so that is awesome that uh, we can just watch it over time, basically. So like the day before we put the ceiling drywall up, uh, if I notice any, I'll have plenty of left over to just throw several more up in spots if we notice it falling down over time. But uh, we didn't use a lot of them because a lot of spaces, like for example, right in here, You've got a PEX line, uh, an electric line, and then another PEX line. So this insulation right here can't fall anywhere because it's just gonna get caught by the utilities. Um, and then again, we've got PEX lines running through here. The cross bracing is gonna stop it. The bridging is gonna stop it from falling down. So there's just so many extra spots that we basically didn't need. So uh, 
We've got, again, plenty left over. Now we just need to finish out the cross bracing over in here, which Aaron kind of moved all of the stuff out of my way so I can just knock these out real quick. And then uh, we've only got two, maybe three bags of insulation left. So again, we're probably gonna be two or three bags short, which I think I said it was gonna be, I think about six bays completely will not get done out of the 15 bays that we have uh, left to do tonight. So that sucks, but again, we'll place the order at Home Depot. Hopefully they can let me have two, three, four bags and I can return the rest of the pallet and uh, I won't get charged an arm and a leg for it. Thank God that is over with. Like I said, I still got six more bays to do, but all of the cross bracing is done. Just have to do six more bays of insulation, which it is gonna be two more bags total. So not that bad, but uh, like I said, just have to make sure Home Depot doesn't overcharge us to return eight full bags that we basically don't need. And man, do I hate repetitive work. I cannot stand doing the same thing over and over and over and over. It drives me nuts. If I didn't have a heart condition, I would love it to be like on Adderall or something so that I could just focus and do the same thing a thousand times over and not absolutely go crazy with it. And sorry for the noise if you guys are hearing this. This regen is absolutely loud as can be. These things go off depending on which one it is. This one's the iron filter right now. These things go off for like almost 20 minutes or something. And just listen how freaking loud these things are. I am really worried that this isn't going to be enough insulation up in the floor here because I don't think I'm going to drywall the ceiling or do anything up in here just because it's going to be really hard, especially with the intake and exhaust pipes over here. But even insulating these walls and putting a door on there, I do not know if that's going to be enough. My God, that thing is loud. You can hear it throughout the entire house so clear. Obviously, it's going to stop once we get the drywall on uh, the ceiling down here, plus the insulation that's up in here. But holy crap, is that thing obnoxious. And the fact that it's going off right now at uh, midnight, I don't know if we need to change that time frame. But holy crap, I don't want to be hearing this if I'm trying to sleep in the master bedroom or if I fall asleep down here on the couch one night but vice versa, I guess the daytime might be a little bit better of a time frame since no one will be home, or I may be sleeping in the daytime too. So I don't know really if there's a good regeneration time to do this, but man, oh man, this thing puts out some decibels. If, uh, if it's picking it up on camera and you can actually tell how loud I have to talk for that thing doing that. All right, so I'm gonna wrap it up here for the night. Uh, my dad's coming back on Friday, so I think we might need a few more pieces of furring strips. We'll go ahead and get the scaffolding, and then hopefully we'll be able to knock out together on Friday, and maybe Saturday if he can come, the rest of the ceiling with his help, and the gable ends on the inside with drywall, and then it'll be 100% done. So hang tight, and I'll see you guys back in a few days. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Happy Friday. So my dad did show up today. We unfortunately didn't get a whole lot done. Uh, we spent a lot of time at Home Depot by the time he got here. And then he left a little early, obviously for the sun goes down, just easier to get home uh, when it's not pitch black outside. But uh, as you can see, we got a little bit done on this side, only one strip. And we got several more pieces on over there, plus the furring strips. So I don't know if I'm gonna finish up the drywall in this video. It is very hard by yourself because you really need two people, one person cranking the lift until you get almost right there on the ceiling and then someone up on top guiding it to where, you know, especially if you're like going like this where you've already got a sheet up so you're trying to get the drywall flush over here and flush around uh, on the bottom. And it's just hard that uh, you crank it up too high. The drywall gets pinched in between the ceiling and it's just easier when someone's kind of up there guiding it and then someone can do the last little bit of crank as it slides into place. So it's just really hard on your own and it's driving me nuts up and down 20 times on a ladder. But we got our lift and thank God it fits my neighbor's lift. So it wasn't like a different width or a length. So fit right over top. It actually works 100% perfectly. Um, the peak of the roof is actually about up to here on my neck. So I'm actually too tall for it. So that is freaking awesome. 
We also got uh, 48 more sheets of uh, 5 8 drywall. And the reason why we got 48 sheets was because I am going to put the 5 8 everywhere on ICF. It is so freaking easy with 5 8 to just screw it right to the blocks. There's no blowouts because uh, you're not compressing. That foam is easy. Uh, for the half inch that it needs compressed until you kind of get to the furring strips. Although it's not supposed to compress, but the drywall blows in and it's not an ultralight drywall. So uh, super stout, way better drywall. So we're going to rip that sheet down right there and we'll put the half inch on the rest of the interior wood walls because it doesn't seem to blow out as easy. And then we're just gonna do five eights on all of the ICF. But good thing I got a 2,500 now because 48 sheets of five eights drywall, that's about 34, 3,500 pounds of weight. A Little bit over what my truck is actually supposed to carry, but it's not too far of a drive. So uh, we were only 300 pounds over and the truck did fine. I was nowhere near the bump stop, so. Freaking awesome that I can have a 2500 to carry that much load actually in the bed of the truck. But what I'm gonna finish out tonight here and probably the rest of this video is we're gonna go up here in the attic and what I've decided since the county's gonna let me put a door from the uh, attic in the garage into this attic over here, um, I'm gonna tap in to the uh, light bulb that's up in the attic and I'm gonna daisy chain on over and put a light bulb up into this flat ceiling, put a light bulb up into the uh, scissor trusses and put a light bulb over in that flat ceiling. So we've got three boxes to do, running the wire, daisy chaining over, and then uh, they didn't have the same type that's in the attic in the garage but I did test these ones out. They are super, super freaking bright and they're also adjustable. So you got three little winglets on here that you can face in any direction to throw light and they can actually like twist upside down. So uh, probably a pretty good bulb for what we're using up in there. And it's a daylight temperature, 5,000 Kelvin. So we'll probably have awesome light up in there when we're actually spray foaming and seeing what the hell we're doing uh, when we're blowing in the insulation and all that. So I'm gonna get a as much tools as I can get. Uh, hopefully we have enough 14-2 uh, wire left over, but we're gonna tap into that light bulb, do three days of chains on over, and then when you go up into the attic from the garage, you'll just turn on that one switch. It will completely light up the attic over there, and it's gonna turn all these on at once also. So uh, if you're going up in the attic, you have to hit that light switch. I'm not gonna put a second light switch up in here that will turn these lights on in, uh, differently because it's just easier uh, from the garage, hit that switch, you're up in the attic, everything is already on and on for you, so you're good to go. Okay, all connections are made. This light bulb obviously is working, so we're just, Running up over through here, made a hole up through this side, and then we'll spray foam that uh, just to keep fumes and stuff out. And again, when we put in our door up here, we'll cut it in between like two trusses, like right here and right here. That way we can just walk right on through this door here and uh, get into that attic space. And again, the county did allow that because as long as we leave a half inch OSB or put some drywall up there, then that door can shut and latch. So that way the attic in here above the garage is separate from the attic in the house. So it'll work, but we'll seal that little hole up there. And uh, again, I think I talked about this in this video. I think with this little lip right here, we might be able to cut out some like pink foam glue a couple pieces together. That way we can set it on top of here, put a two by four over here, and then that way the foam can just sit down in here and touch this uh, wood over here, the back wood over there, and just sit on those two little ledges. And then that way we can put like an R30 or something up in there, and uh, that'll keep that ladder access hatch a little bit more comfortable so that we're not losing heat in the garage. So fingers crossed these things are working and holy crap, yes they are. These are sweet. Look how bright these things are. So one over there, one in the middle, one all the way over there. I've got them angled so I gave them a little bit of a tilt so that way they're not shining straight down. They're kind of each one of them at an angle. So that way we get plenty of light kind of scattered everywhere throughout there. But that 100% will work. Once all the ceiling is on 
Everything is insulated. You could come up here at any point in time from now until the rest of time. And uh, you can see every little spot. So that is awesome. I can see every single corner, no problem. We can get the spray foam guys up here. They won't have a problem with what they're doing and seeing to hit everything. And uh, when I do the blown in insulation, uh, that is more than enough light to see everything. So that is awesome. But all right, guys, I am sorry. Gonna wrap it up here. I am exhausted and uh, we're out of furring strips again. So I've cashed out two stores now on all of their one by three furring strips. So I've only got eight left. So really all I could do is a little bit up in there and then I'd be done. But again, the uh, scaffolding here is gonna work freaking awesome. I can get to absolutely everything up in there and hit everything no problem at all. And uh, from the ladder over here, I think it'll be pretty easy. We don't have to do any furring strips, but we can just start cutting out those triangle pieces and start screwing them into there. And I am gonna use the 5 eighths up on there too, instead of the half inch, even though it's a wood stud and it's a flat wall, I'd rather use the 5 eighths just because you're almost two foot on center there and half inch, I don't want it to bow or move or anything over time. So if we use the 5 eighths up there on the gable ends, that'll be really strong. And then the spray foam guys can come over and just spray the crap out of everything on the flat ceilings, up on those gable end walls and we ha may have them spray those walls pretty thick. The gable ends may be like four inches. So that way we're getting good insulation as that's kind of like an interior or an exterior wall. Uh, I don't think we need to really spray an R60 there, even though that is attic space. So that does kind of suck to do an R60 on all the flat ceilings, but then only do like an R28 on the gable wall. But an R28 of closed cell, I think will probably be better than even 60 inches of blown in, um, just because of how airtight it is, how structurally strong it's going to be. And uh, these gable end walls should just be reinforced like crazy and shouldn't give us really any problems. But I need to get to bed. It is, I've been up all day because my dad came over in the morning. I had to reverse my schedule there. So I'm on the opposite uh, time frame right now. So I'm gonna wrap it up here. Thanks for stopping out. Uh, we will get back to this on a later date in a later video. We still have a few more days on the drywall lift, so not a problem at all. But uh, if you guys enjoyed another one, if you like the way this is all coming together, hit that thumbs up button, please. Subscribe if you're not already. And you guys are more than welcome to hit us up and personal message us on Instagram, Neck of the Woods 2020. And again, Aaron will send, uh, do some special pictures in there. So you guys are a little bit ahead of the game on Instagram than you are on YouTube. But until next time, we will see you guys later. Take care.